All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we're going to continue a series that I started last week. So last week's Dharma Doors, I started a new series for the year. And this is, or not for the whole year, but for the first uh, little bit here. And we're going to be doing, or I'm doing a series on upaya, skillful means. And so we're sort of have, we kind of have a, a grand theme for tonight and a grand theme for the series, which is this idea of expedient means or skillful means. And then under that umbrella of upaya, we are going to look at um, different uh, paramitas, actually, different practices, but we're going to specifically look at them in terms of skillfulness, in terms of expediency in that way. So upaya. So we started last week by talking about skillful giving. And just a quick review to give you an idea about the, about the series. <clears throat> The idea that generosity or giving, the idea that that is something one should do, especially if one is a practicing Buddhist in that sense, there's a way in which one should be generous. But what we talked about last time were sort of skillful ways of being generous because there's a lot of different situations that might arise. And so what we basically got to is that in the bodhisattva path, in the Mahayana tradition, a bodhisattva's actions, in particular, an action like giving, it's always coming from a place of loving kindness and compassion. That's the idea. And that's what would make it skillful or that's what would make it expedient. If one's heart was in the right place, they will always kind of give expediently or skillfully in that way. So tonight, we're going to look at the second paramita, which is shila. Usually, shila is translated as uh, what? Morality, discipline, moral discipline. Uh, ethics, I've heard or I've seen translated. And in particular, what I want to talk about tonight is something that I don't usually talk about. I want to talk about the five precepts. So we're going to do a deep dive into the five precepts. But specifically, we're going to be looking at them through the lens of the Mahayana tradition, the Bodhisattva path, and this idea of upaya. So this should be interesting. Um, yeah, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. I will eventually tonight uh, get back to reading from our sutra. There is a section I want to read that has to do with discipline or shila. But I thought because I don't spend enough time talking about, in, in a way, I don't spend enough time just talking about practice. You know, I Dharma Doors is very philosophical. I'm very interested in the Dharma <clears throat> as a philosophical tradition. So we spend a lot of time with the more uh, heady, intellectual, philosophical ideas. And so I don't get around to talking a lot about morality and the precepts like that. And so that's what I want to do tonight. So... <clears throat> I assume all of you know this, but because these are recorded, and of course, you know, who knows, I want to, you know, go through this. So you may or may not already know this, but within the world of Buddhism, in the world of being a Buddhist, there are these five precepts, they're called, rules, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you want to call these, right? But there are these five ideas, and really quickly, there are these um, prohibitions or precepts against killing, stealing, 
sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxicants. Just very simply. Now, we're going to go in deep into each one of these. It wouldn't be Dharma doors if we didn't do a little etymology. So we're going to dig into what these words, what the original Pali words kind of actually mean and all of that. But then, of course, what we're going to focus on, though, is the kind of the, the bodhisattva's approach to the precepts, the upayak or skillful approach to the precepts. And basically, just to kind of put this out very simply, in some Buddhist traditions, the, these precepts, the five precepts, they're kind of usually presented as thou shalt not. <laughs> like a rule, like, oh, you want to be a Buddhist? Okay, thou shalt not be violent. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. If you're going to be a monk, thou shalt not have sex. Thou shalt not lie. And thou shalt not drink. Thou shalt not intoxicate. And the idea is, is that that's one way to approach the precepts, that they are just the rules. And they were rules that were laid down by the Buddha, preserved by Buddhists for several thousand years, 2,000 or more years. And so to be a good Buddhist is to follow them, period. <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> but that's not how we're going to approach that, these tonight. So the upaya, the first kind of aspect of upaya, is we kind of want to be thinking about why these five precepts maybe make a lot of sense and why it's actually very wise to observe these five things. In other words, not thou shalt not, and not just because the Buddha says, but actually because you, the Bodhisattva, have realized the wisdom of these five things. So let's start with the first one. Um, yeah, let's start with the first one, but I have a few more remarks that pertain to all of them, but I want to use the first one as kind of a, wor a working example. So the first precept, the first aspect of Shila, morality in Buddhism, is this prohibition against, well, killing, taking life. Oh, I should also mention that the general formula in the world of Buddhism is it's about making the attempt to abstain from these things. And right away, I want you to know or notice that the Buddhist approach to these is, is rather gentle. It's not this command from on high, you, thou shalt not do this. <laughs> it's a little more like, make a really good effort to abstain from doing these things. And I think that that's important to, to start with that. And, and actually, this is leading to my first point. So even before yeah, even before we get into this specific precept against uh, taking life, against killing, I want to mention that there's another, another difference here between these Buddhist precepts or these, you know, observances and maybe some other religious traditions. What I want to kind of introduce as a as a underlying theme tonight is that there's a general sense within the overall buddhist philosophy there's a general understanding that these things specifically these uh, first few of them there's a understanding that these are actually kind of part of the evolutionary biological program of mammals. 
So what I mean is, is that Buddhism recognizes that we human beings, these mammalian creatures, are entirely prone to doing these things. It, in other words, it is not considered an, um, an aberration or like, um, you mean you, you were violent? Wow, like that's crazy. No, actually the idea is, is that to get angry, to even become violent is part of the program and so just using that one right there as an example, this idea of against being violent, even so violent as to kill, Buddhism recognizes that all, most of the animals out there in the world are killing other animals in order to survive, that it's part of the program. And most animals, most mammals, if you provoke them, they will get angry and probably violent in some way to defend themselves. So right away, Buddhism recognizes that we are all in a way predisposed and programmed to do these things. And that's where the idea of discipline comes in. So a lot of times the word shila is translated as discipline. And the idea of it is that we are, if you are a Buddhist, if you are practicing the Dharma, you're going what, what they call against the stream. You're going against the current of evolutionary programming. And effectively, just to put this very simply, the process here of Buddhism is actually about transcending that biological program. In other words, it's actually reaching a kind of superhuman or transhuman state to overcome these things. And that will also relate, I'll have a little bit more to say about that, um, a, a few precepts down the line, but an idea that I would wanna tell you now is that these precepts, this is very much about self-mastery. The idea of being sovereign, free, not subject to conditioning, not subject to the program, but actually rising above the program, going against the stream of the program, and reaching a somewhat exalted state of being. Now, that would also be the, the more traditional yoga understanding of these things, too, where we are, through our practice, through a, a yoga practice, we're reaching a state of transcendence. And so again, I want to make that really clear is that these things are understood to be part of the program, but whether we go along with them or not, that will determine how free we are. Are we entirely conditioned and we're just along for the ride? Or are we autonomous, sovereign beings? From the Buddhist point of view, every human being walks a very fine line between those two. And depending upon how they play it, they, a human either falls back into conditioning and is just along for the ride, or they transcend that and go against the stream in that way. So, and that's going to go for all of these, but let's kind of do a deeper dive now into the idea of Panya Atipata. So Panna Atipata is the description for what is translated as killing. The, the main word of Panna Atipata is Panna. Oh, and by the way, I should have said this earlier too. Tonight is going to be a rare occasion where I'm kind of pretty much only using uh, Pali, 
the Pali language, Pali words. And it's because the precepts are such an old original part of Buddhism that they do, all of these do have Sanskrit equivalents, but the Pali words for these are kind of more popular or more well-known. So I say that because Panna of Panna Atipata, Panna, you might know it by the Sanskrit word Prana. Prana as life force energy, the breath of life. And so Atipata means to destroy, to slay. So Panna Atipata is to destroy or slay that which has Prana, that which has Panna, a life force energy. So Yes, this is a prohibition against killing in that way. And I, yeah, let's, let's start off, dive right in. So in general, this prohibition, this precept is understood to be against all forms of killing, not just a uh, homicide, as we would call it. So if it, even if it's a bug, the, the Buddhist who has taken the precepts, who is, who, is, who is observing these precepts, would avoid, abstain from killing even a bug, let alone a larger creature and Buddha forbid a human being in that way, right? So that's the prohibition. Okay. Now, the idea here is, is that most of the world's major religions have a prohibition against killing. It's, you know, that's one of the major ones that kind of really, you know, it's almost as if every religious tradition from Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Jainism, this is one they all agree on, that this is to be avoided. Now, once again, maybe you might observe this, it, you know, if you are, you know, let's say a Christian, you might observe not killing because God said so, because it's one of the commandments, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is one of the commandments. In that tradition, God did say not to kill. So if you do that, you're kind of going against God's wishes in that way. But again, in the Buddhist world, of course, there is no God in that sense. Buddha is not a God. Buddha is just a human that reached this transcendent state that I'm talking about. And so this prohibition or this precept against killing. One of the ideas, another idea that I want to drop on you tonight so in addition to the underlying theme that all of these are part of our conditioning, that they're part of a program, so there's that. But then I also want to add to this, add to it this. From a certain Buddhist point of view, all five of these are considered like, how could I put this? They're considered kind of childish behavior, not developed. And the idea here is, is that a lot of children have a tendency to be violent. <laughs> and the idea is, is that I know, I remember, and I'm going to also try to uh, fill tonight with as much personal, like, practice and anecdotes as I can, but I remember once when I was a kid, I lived in a little cul-de-sac, and I remember all of the neighborhood kids getting together to try to capture a cat to kill it, and I remember not really being interested in doing that. I remember kind of being like, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really into that. And I remember basically 
not going along with the group that was going to do that. Now, the point that, that I'm trying to make, though, is that once again, it's kind of part of the program to be violent in that way. And it's a very childish behavior in that way. There's a lot going on with violence and particularly like killing. And when I say there's a lot going on with it, what I mean is, is this. I, I Right now, right away tonight, I really want to, because this is part of the upaya. So now I'm going to mention a little bit of upaya. Tonight, I really want to remove like certain hypothetical scenarios such as like, you know, but, but what if somebody's coming at you with a knife and a gun and this and this and that, right? I mean, I, I will probably talk about that, like a hypothetical scenario such as that. But my point is, is let's go back to that, that little group of kids in the cul-de-sac. The cat was not threatening us little kids. <laughs> and yet there was still this strange desire to capture it, torture it, and kill it. So my point is, is that tonight I'm talking about that behavior, like the kind of almost desire to be violent, the almost desire to dominate, and even a kind of desire to kill. Now, if you're thinking, I don't, I don't have the desire to kill. That's not part of my programming. I really hope that's true. Like, honestly, honestly do. I'm not so, uh, I'm not there. And one of the ways, and now, like I said, even as a, as a child, I was not into that, the violence that a lot of my friends were in that way. But what I'm thinking of now is what I'm thinking of now is let's say a mosquito lands on you. They would land on me sometimes. The idea of die, that's breaking the precept. And I know that you, someone might say, oh, but it's it's a it it har it carries diseases. I'm defending myself. Da 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 da. Yep, I used to I used to tell myself that too. But the idea here is is there's sort of two things going on. There's the act. There's the act of killing the mosquito, and then there's the the desire for that being, that creature to no longer exist. Like the desire for it to die. And tonight we definitely need to separate those two. All right, so that what we're, what I'm really focusing on is this kind of desire to dominate, the desire to be violent, that desire in that way. And um, by the way, and actually, I already realized time's flying by. So um, I need to mention this so I can get to the upaya a little bit. So there's another aspect of uh, panna atipata, this avoidance of killing. There's another aspect of it, which is that um, suicide is also considered violent killing and not on the table like that's also considered uh, a breaking of the first precept but now though i want to mention a situation some of you may be aware you probably are aware of the uh the vietnamese buddhist monks that self-immolated that burned themselves alive 
in protest to the Vietnam War. There are presently, today, in the modern world, many, meaning in over the past many years, there have been many Tibetan Buddhist monks who have self-immolated, meaning they have burned themselves alive, in protest to the Chinese occupation of Tibet. Now, both of those situations, the, uh, in protest of the Vietnam War, in protest of Chinese occupation, the suiciding, the, the killing of themselves, would be considered breaking the first precept. Except within the Mahayana tradition, which both of those monks, both the Zen monks of Vietnam and the, the Tibetan monks of Tibet, that act of demonstration, that highest state of demonstration against, against the war and against occupation, that is considered upaya. And it's considered upaya because both of, or both of those situations, the monastics were leading from a place of compassion for all sentient beings. And the idea had been, and the idea is that in Tibet, the occupation is no good and it's not stopping. And we have reached the point of no other choice. And so to get the word out, to make this big protest, they resort to self-immolating, to, to burning themselves alive. And my point is, is that it's considered upaya because they are leading from a place of compassion, not a place of self-loathing, not a place of, oh, like, you know, this sucks, so I'm just, I'm out of here. So they're not su like killing themselves in that way. It is an act of upaya. So that's just going to be one scenario that I will mention in the Buddhist world where a certain form of violence and a certain form of killing is considered allowable, permissible, because of this um, upayic sense of coming from a place of loving kindness and compassion. Now, we could get into other tr more tricky situations, you know, where it's about, you know, um, an infestation of bees that is going to jeopardize the, the health and well-being of a community of people. Do we, do we kill all the bees? in order to protect these people or you know, some other infestation. The whole point that I was trying to make in my first installment of this series is that if it's coming from a place of loving kindness and compassion, it's upayak and that's the driving force in that way. Not, I hate bees, die bees, die. This is terrible, you know, no. And by the way, in the Mahayana tradition, if, if it has been deemed necessary to take a bug or some other animal's life, if it has been deemed necessary, it would be done with the utmost humility, the utmost like regret for having to do it. And so once again, I'm going back to like my mosquito example. It's one thing to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's one thing. It's a whole other thing to actually have like the desire to kill and almost to like get off on it. Those are two totally different things in terms of upaya. So in general, 
we are abstaining, avoiding all forms of killing, but that within the land of Upaya, there may be some situation where it's necessary. And then we have to check in with our compassion meter, making sure we're doing it for the right reason. And then when we do it all the way through, it's done with loving kindness and compassion. So, by the way, I also want to do this. Each of these precepts, like, for example, the prohibition against killing, each of these precepts kind of has their opposite. And the opposite that in, in terms of what we would want to be cultivating, I've already said it several times, the opposite of the first precept is loving kindness and compassion. That is the opposite of this desire to be violent or to kill in that way. Now, the one last thing, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say a lot more as we go through this, but I do want to say one more thing about this. So I, I started a moment ago, and I mentioned a hypothetical scenario where you, you are threatened. And so the idea is, is that, well, come on, Buddha, I've got to defend myself so I can beat the crap out of this guy, right? Because he's, he, was, he was coming for me first. So it's okay for me to be violent, right? For me, I, for me, and I've been in some pretty, uh, precarious situations like that. I don't know, but for me, I have always found a way around being violent. I've always managed to find a way of getting being getting around that and actually not having to be uh, violent in return to violence. Now, I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, that somebody gets in a situation where it is the last resort. Sure. But what I'm getting at, or the point I'm trying to make, is the, the, especially when we're thinking about the bodhisattva practicing these precepts, the bodhisattva, you know, is really cultivating wisdom here. And the idea is, is that it would be the least wise answer to meet violence with violence. That would be the least wise. In fact, from my opening statements about the evolutionary biological programming, meeting violence with violence is the most obvious, predictable, programmed way to deal with that. And so if we're going for this exalted state of Buddhahood, right? If we are going for the transcendence that I was talking about, the idea is, is that meeting violence with violence, it, it will perpetuate the cycle of violence. And that perpetuating the cycle of violence is exactly what I was talking about in my opening remarks about falling right back in to the conditioned program. In other words, you, me, we're conditioned to be violent. It's built into us to do it that way. And so to not do that is a tremendous exercise of freedom. And I want to say this because I know that there's a way, especially with kind of um, modern culture's obsession with violence, modern culture's obsession with fighting and all of that, I know that it can seem, I know the, the youth, the youth can be convinced that if I could beat you up, then I'm free in that way. Like I'm 
free if I can destroy everybody around me? Well, from a Buddhist point of view, you're super conditioned. You're not free at all. You're falling right into the program. It's actually the bodhisattva who could be violent, but chooses not to be. That's freedom. That's actual autonomy in that way, from a Buddhist point of view. Okay, questions, comments, answers, ideas about the first precept against violence or killing. Excellent. Let's move on to number two. So the second precept is against stealing. The Pali term is adinadana. And the root of that word is dana, actually kind of twice in a way. But what adinadana means is taking that which has not been given. So dana, I know that you know this word dana from last week. Dana is giving. Adana, adana means it has not been given. And adin adana, taking that which has not been donad or given. We call it stealing, but I like, I think it's important from a Buddhist point of view to know that that word has to do with dana, but the, it's like adana in that way. Okay, so this again is this prohibition against stealing. Regarding the evolutionary program, what instantly comes to mind is a snake stealing the eggs of a chicken. Snake does not care that these eggs belong to the mother hen. The snake doesn't care. The snake is just going to take what it wants. And that is exactly what this second precept is about. The evolutionary biological program to just take what I want. No respect for others. No, nothing like that, but just this idea that I want it, I take it. Now, once again, as I said, you could observe these precepts as strictly like, oh, Buddha said don't steal, so I don't steal. And that's one way to observe the precepts, just as like rules that you follow. But let's do this little bodhisattva work I'm talking about, and let's dig a little deeper into stealing. So from a Buddhist point of view, stealing is obviously about attachment, wanting, craving. And wanting or craving so much that you don't give a damn if it's somebody else's property. You actually want it that bad. You crave it that much that you will steal it, right? So the idea from a Buddhist point of view, from the point of the Bodhisattva point of view, I should say, coming from a place of wisdom, a Bodhisattva understands that the grand project here, I'm talking like the Four Noble Truths, the big project of, of Buddhism is about controlling our desire. Our desire, which is typically out of control. But let's not forget what the noble truth is. The noble truth is that that very wanting, the very craving, produces our own suffering. So the wise Buddhist understands that even though it's like, oh, I really, really, really want that. I really, really want whatever that is, right? The idea, the, the, 
the the Buddhists the Buddhists will use this term, the common worldling. So not your transcendent enlightened bodhisattva, but the common worldling. The common worldling thinks, if 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 I could have that, meaning if if I could if I had that, I'd be happy. I'm not happy now, or at least I'm not as happy as I could be. But if I had that thing, whatever it is, I would be happy. And so the common worldling thinks that satisfying their desires is happiness. But the Buddhist, according to the Four Noble Truths, understands that that very craving, that very needing and wanting actually is producing the anxiety and the stress and the suffering that, that you feel would be alleviated by having that thing. But it becomes a vicious cycle in that sense. Because, like the Buddha says, these things don't last. And so I get that thing, and now I'm happy. But then I lose that thing, and now I'm upset, and I got to go get another one. Whereas, if I could actually self-control and rise above that desire and that craving, if I were free of desire and craving, that would be happier than I could ever know actually. And so the precept against stealing, it's a precept that is trying to encourage you to, to not suffer. Even though, again, the common worldling thinks, no, if I had that thing, that would be happiness. And then they go so far as to steal that thing that they think is going to bring them happiness. So from the bodhisattva point of view, all of that is just totally backwards. It doesn't make any sense. And so the opposite of stealing is, of course, giving, being generous, not taking, giving. And as we discussed last week, because last week was all about giving, the bodhisattva understands that it is in their own best interest to be generous. And it's actually detrimental to themselves to be stingy and to hold on. Because what does holding on do? That produces the dukkha. That's the noble truth about all of this. So in other words, what I'm kind of getting around to, which I didn't realize I was going to do, the, the precepts here are about keeping us in line with the Four Noble Truths in that way. And, and recognizing that we have all of these behaviors that diverge us from the Four Noble Truths. Okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about taking what's not given. Yeah, no. Um, I'm just getting this like sense of there is like a cyclical nature to something like uh, craving. Well, to craving. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what else is like craving. Sure. But just where like, I mean, if if stealing is a way of helping us avoid crave, because we think craving leads to stealing, but it's almost like it's also saying that stealing leads to craving. Like taking things leads to wanting more things. I guess it, not just stealing, but taking. Excellent. That's excellent. Funny. No, you you literally <laughs> took words out of my mouth that I forgot to say. <laughs> well, I heard it. Thank you. But yeah, re but really in that way that it it is perpetuating a cycle that we think is will break it, but it actually perpetuates it. Yeah. Excellent. And we're going to see that that's true of all of these. 
in that way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. By the way, I didn't mention. So the upaya of taking what has not been given. It may so happen, right, that there is that very, very, very unfortunate situation where the mother or the father or whoever's got all the kids and they're broke and they're starving. And if I could just steal the proverbial loaf of bread to feed my kids, right? But Buddha, is it okay for me to steal this loaf of bread to feed my kids? Once again, I would suggest that from the Bodhisattva point of view, leading from a place of kindness and compassion, if it was actually to feed the children and not a, uh, my kids really want to see me in this brand new uh, jacket, right? And it would really make my kids happy if I had this brand new jacket. So I got to go steal this cool jacket. No, one has to be honest with themselves if one is going to break the precept against taking what has not been given. If you're going to do that, and you're going to say, but I'm doing it out of upaya, out of kindness and compassion. I said this last week, and I'll say it again. Only you know if that's true. I can't know if that's true. You, nobody else can really know what the intentions are but you. And so if you as a bodhisattva are genuinely coming from a place of kindness and compassion, then we would still recognize that we're breaking a precept. There would, we wouldn't want to be ignorant here and think, oh, but it's not stealing. It's not taking what hasn't been given. No, no, no. It's, the bodhisattva is honest with themselves that they are breaking a precept. And it's important for me to mention that because, you know, the bodhisattva is always aware of these things. But again, the idea is that kindness and compassion supersedes certain uh, moral obligations in that way. So, okay. So let's get to the first of the tricky ones. <laughs> so the third precept is the one about sexuality, right? So this is uh, kama sumicha chara. So wrong, the wrong doing of kama. Kama is this, um, in, in the precept here, it's K-A-M-E, but if it's all by itself, it's going to be K-A-M-M-A, kama, sensual pleasure. You know, you've heard about it. You've heard about the Kama Sutra, right? That famous sutra that's not a Buddhist sutra, right? It's just a Hindu text about sexuality, about maximizing sexual, sensual pleasure, otherwise known as Kama, K-A-M-M-A. So. This rule is about the wrong, the sumicha, the wrong chara doing of kama. So let's get into it. So of course, as you know, or probably know, Buddhism started out as a renunciatory monastic tradition. And what that meant was, is that to be a Buddhist in the early days was to abstain from sex, period, period. And actually not, I, I want to go a step further. It wasn't just about abstaining from sex. It was abstaining from sexuality altogether, which mainly I'm talking about masturbation. So coitus and masturbation, all of that is included or was originally included in this precept. Now, in the lay Buddhist community, so the non-monastic community, 
this precept gets tran or interpreted, not translated, but interpreted a lot of different ways. Um, and it's kind of what makes this one so tricky. It's so tricky because Buddhism used to be a renunciatory monastic tradition. And they were all about abstaining from sexuality. But as Buddhism grew and changed and spread all around, it ceased being an exclusively monastic renunciatory path and became a more, um, uh, I don't even know what I would call it then, well, a, a non-monastic tradition in that way. So what do, what do we do about this third precept if we are getting married, if we are thinking about children, all, it gets hard to have children if you're going to observe this precept, right? So let's kind of break it down. So the one thing that I want to go back to very, very quickly is my opening remark about the evolutionary biological program. If there's anything that we humans that we mammals, if there's anything that we are evolutionary programmed to do, it's to reproduce, all right? So once again, Buddhism recognizes that the, the desire to have sex, the act of having sex, all of that, Buddhism recognizes that we are all programmed to do that. In fact, it gets, it gets an even even more interesting. Not only have we been kind of programmed to do that, but because nature, because nature basically didn't trust you, didn't trust that you would be smart enough to reproduce, nature made sure that sex is one of the best feeling things. That idea of being touched, touching certain regions of the body, having so many nerve endings that it's very, very, very pleasurable, all of that. That's nature's way of making sure that you do your, your mammalian duty and reproduce in that way. So insofar as Buddhism is kind of going against the stream of the biological conditioning, there couldn't be anything more against the stream than abstaining from sexuality, all right? So it fits into that idea, but I wanna go a little further with this. So the, the main idea that I kind of want to focus on is this idea of, well, basically masturbation. Let's put sex like uh, coitus, as it were, let's put that over here for a second. So the idea here is, is that we have these desires, we have this programming, and that programming or that desire, if you really investigate it, it is, as I've been saying, it seems to be a part of evolution and a part of the biological program to reproduce, right? And like I said, because nature didn't trust you, they made it feel really good. So the idea is, is that masturbation is sort of this, it's just the desire without the function, the function of keeping the, the human species going and all of that. So there's a way in which this desire, the desire to masturbate, the desire to have sex, all of that, there's a way in which it, it's almost the the it's it's the the best example 
of the way in which we are, how, how can I put this? It's one of the best examples of the way in which we are up against our own body. And my point about this is, is let's say, and oh, I should say this too. I want to say, make sure I mention this. Buddhism, of course, is not the only tradition that sort of well, talks about abstaining from sexuality. And specifically what I'm talking about is all of the varieties of what we would call yoga. And over in China, where they have an, kind of an indigenous form of yoga, uh, that's part of kind of the Taoist tradition, they're very much about abstaining from sexuality as part of the yoga tradition. And I want you to know that it is a kind of a part of the, the science of yoga. The science of yoga is actually about how that sexual energy is, well, it's something to be worked with. And in particular, it is something that, well, basically, let me just put it to you very simply, that sexual energy gets us very worked up. <laughs> it gets us very worked up in a lot of different ways. And in general, if you're going for like a meditative state, if you're going for these calm, still states of meditation, the science, not morality, this doesn't have anything to do with morality at this point. It's about biology and science. And it's this idea that these things affect our, our minds in a way. And I would at this point, want to return to something from my opening remark or my opening remarks, which is about how from a certain Buddhist point of view, these behaviors are a little childish in that way. And what I mean is, is that if you think about an adolescent going through puberty and having all of these sexual um, feelings and all of these sexual impulses for the first time, there's a way in which, um, and again, I will, I will only speak from personal experience. I know that as a young man, when I was going through puberty and all of that, there wasn't much else in the world that I wanted to do. <laughs> and, and meaning that when that, when that impulse came over me, you'd be hard pressed to get me to concentrate and focus on my homework or focus on anything. And in fact, if I remember what it was like back then, until that desire was satisfied, I couldn't, I couldn't think about anything else. And then of course I get the opportunity I get to release that sexual energy, right? And now, okay, now I can do my homework. Now I can do all of that. And the idea is, is the, the Buddhists, the yogis, the Taoists, they all recognize that that sexual energy is a great disturbance to the mind and all of that. And in particular, again, if... If one isn't uh, if one isn't having sex to have a baby and keep the species going, then it is just entirely um, this mm, perpetuating problem, kind of like uh, Noam's statement mentioned, this kind of cyclical cyclicality to it in that way. And, and if you've ever tried to not release sexual energy, it's one of those things that you do, you will recognize. I don't know who out there who's listening, who has deeply practiced yoga or what have you, but there is a way in which that tendency or that desire subsides. 
But if you have allowed it to subside and then it comes back, what you will notice is that giving into it makes it harder to not give into it, which makes it harder to not give into it. And it then gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And in particular, if you have ever decided, you know, I want to, I want to maybe give that a shot. If you have ever decided, you know, I'm going to abstain from masturbating or what have you just for like a week. It's a great practice because you will, again, you will realize that you, it's, it's like, I don't want to do that, but I do want to do that. And right there, we are split. We are, we are fractured. There's a part of us that says, I don't want to do that. And then a part of us that says, no, I do want to do that. And then it's a question of well, who, who wins that battle in that way. So in other words, what I want to get to in terms of upaya, in general, what I want to mention in terms of upaya is this. Let's not vilify sexuality. I have not wanted to vilify and make an enemy out of sexuality. In other words, I, I want to avoid a kind of um, um, uh, pur puritanism, as it would be called. So it's not that sexuality here is bad or evil or anything like that. This is, for me, all about self-mastery. Um, and I'm again, I'm speaking like kind of from a yoga point of view here. And so what I mean is what the Bodhisattva would, for, in my opinion, in my interpretation, what the Bodhisattva would be very interested in developing is total control over their sexuality so that they are not a slave to it. They are not, you know, um, governed by it, but actually able to fully control it so that if they would like to have sex, certainly give rise to that. But it's not that the arising of the desire has happened and then it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta find somebody or I gotta, you know. That would be, again, that would be not self-mastery. And indeed, that is what even most, a lot of the yoga traditions describe is a kind of mastery of the sexual energy. Not exactly a complete uh, suppression of it, but a mastery of it. So I hope that makes sense. Um, questions, comments, answers, ideas about sexuality. Yeah, Noe, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. For, um, it's a very interesting that that the, you you mentioned that the, the the condition is or there is you know, is to procreate the common. It's appropriate. Uh, I have never had that condition. <laughs> and I've had many opportunities, but, uh, and, and I find not just in the human species, but also in the animal species, it, it's not always about procreation. It's, it's the pleasure, uh, 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 you know, it's a pleasure thing. It has nothing to do with procreation. Honestly, I don't believe it has really, that's a small part of, of existence uh, as I see it, you know, as I see it, you know, go to the zoo on a hot day and go look at the monkeys. <laughs> And I don't feel that I'm not that far away from a monkey, mm -hmm. you know, as in the sense of, you know, really, yes. But I do, but I also understand the, what you're talking about is that it will lead to suffering. It has. It's that thing, what is causing suffering. 
Got that control. Oh, I don't have that. I want that. I don't have that. I want that. Oh, I have that. Now I don't want it anymore. <laughs> this is suka duka. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Noe. No, and I, I hear what you're saying, Noe. And I would also, I, I totally hear what you're saying. I would also then want to just throw into that the I, again it's sort of a lot of the remarks that have now become part of all of these which it's sort of about this uh conditioning and then activities that perpetuate conditioning in that way that's all i are going to want and then of course the ideas about desire wanting craving and suffering and i guess in particular what I would just want to focus on is the dukkha that arises when the sexual energy, the sexual desire arises, and it can't be satisfied. Dukkha. Versus a, an opportunity to copulate <laughs> has arisen. Uh, it, it, wow, this is great. The Bodhisattva would say, in a way, have a good time in that sense. Be pleasurable and be kind and be gentle to one another. What we're into, or what tonight's talk is about, is about the desperate need for it, the desperate, the desperation for it, and then the dukkha or the suffering that comes from, but I can't. That's what I wanted to get across with this one. Okay, on to the fourth precept, uh, musavada, wrong vada. Vada is speech. The root of that is vach. So wrong speaking, which is understood to be false speech, which we call lying. So the fourth precept, is against false speech, deception, otherwise we called lying. Now, this is one that doesn't actually fit so neatly into my um, underlying theme of evolutionary biological programming. Because, uh, you know, there is probably a degree of deception, of course, that goes on in nature. But the idea of verbally lying, it kind of is a human thing in that way. So let me just mention this. Of course, the opposite of false speech, the opposite of this precept is truthfulness, satya. So satya is the truth, and then there's falsehood and deception. So there's, again, I could, I, I wouldn't do it, but one could just tell you, don't lie. You want to be a good Buddhist? Don't lie. Thou shalt not lie. But I want to dig deeper into the act of lying. I want to, tonight, I want to dig just really quickly, I want to dig a little deeper and what I want you to be thinking about is this other principal main Buddhist idea. So one of the main principal Buddhist ideas, in addition to the Four Noble Truths, is this teaching of the, about the self. In particular, this idea of no self, but the delusion that there is a self. Lying has a lot to do with ego and self. The idea being that we have this, um, well, I'll use, I'll use an example. Again, I'm trying to use personal examples. Um, the thing I'm thinking about is I used to be more prone to this. I try to actually be a good Buddhist. <laughs> These days, I try to be a good Buddhist in, in terms of the precepts. But 
back maybe 10 years ago, I was a lot more lax about the precepts. And one of the way, one of the things that I would do is if, so I used to, again, this is a while ago, but I used to like fast food. <laughs> so Taco Bell, uh, you name it, I was into it, right? But if somebody, at, like, let's say I had, I had a uh, um, fast food for lunch. If somebody asked me, what'd you have for lunch? I would often lie and say, oh, a salad. Why? Why would I do that? Right? Could it be that I wanted this person to perceive me in a certain way? Could it be that even 10 years ago, I was a Dharma teacher? And I wanted people to be like, oh, of course he would have a salad. He's a Buddhist Dharma teacher, right? Whereas if I told them that I had fast food, of course, I was thinking that they would, well, what kind of Dharma teacher eats fast food? I shouldn't listen to this Dharma teacher then. At least that was, of course, what was going on in my ridiculous mind. And so I committed often these little white lies right? It's just a little white lie. Who cares if it was a salad or a fast food, right? Well, that's a lot like killing a mosquito with malice. It doesn't matter if it's just a little white lie. Why the deception? Why the false speech? The bodhisattva, now 10 years later, understands, oh, I was trying to defend a certain sense of self, a certain ego. But here's the thing. The salad, the salad eating Michael didn't exist. The truth was that I was a fast food eating Michael. But I had presented this false facade of a good salad eater, right? And again, 10 years later, I can look back on that and I can say, oh, what, how childish, how silly. And in particular, it was silly because I wasn't a good salad eating person but i i wanted to be or whatever i wanted people to think i was that and so my point is is that that kind of creates deception lying it creates these two realities the reality where i had fast food and then this false reality where i'm a salad eating kind of a person and now I've told all these people that I'm a salad eater, right? And they think that they're, they, they think that's Michael. So all of that is what the Buddhists are talking about in terms of the delusion of the self. <laughs> that's all delusion of self in that way. In particular, because I was actually eating fast food, but then fabricating this other self. And so not being honest with that you know it's just ridiculous yeah jenny um oh gosh so many windows uh <laughs> it speaks to the idea of the child and the child mind and i think you even said some time ago that the buddha there was a reason that the Buddha didn't allow children to be enlightened or didn't teach children because they had to go through this experiential period of time, which is no different than you 10 years ago, right? And so we are all children. And as we deepen our practice, 
our child like views our, I don't know, I don't, I don't know the right word for it, but become less so because it's like we don't really understand the four noble truths until we start practicing. And then, you know, it just leads to all the other lists that then we don't have to try. But at 23, if I was given this list, it was like, okay, maybe tomorrow. Right? So um, I yep. don't know if that's it. Yep. Great point. By the way, what for those out you that out there that don't know, what Jenny is referring to is that in the early days of Buddhism, you had to be 20 years old to join the monastic order. And they basically were like, if, if, if you haven't lived a little, if you haven't suffered a little, what we're telling you, what, what we're teaching isn't going to make any sense. Come back when you're 20. Um, it cha that changes a little bit, but there is that general sense in which Buddhism is for adults in that way. So. Okay, so before I run it, oh yeah, Izzy, please. Um, how about somebody ask you a question that's none of their business? Do you have permission to lie? So thank you, Izzy. You brought me back to the upaya portion of the evening. So this is one that comes up a lot, um, which is this idea of, you know, sort of mm, lying, but you kind of, quote, have a good reason. And I would, once again, I would say that if the bodhisattva is leading from a place of kindness and compassion, that sort of upayakly supersedes the prohibition against false speech. And I say that because, you know, I, I wanted to give you, for me, a, a, good, a good explanation against lying, like a good explanation. And this idea about the self and delusion and all of that, that's what I really think this precept is all about. So my point is, is that in, in regards to Izzy's question or just a scenario where, you know, you know, somebody comes up and says, you know, do I look good in this or whatever, right? And, you know, I, I'm looking for a better example. That was a, a terrible example, but I think everybody out there, I think you know what I mean, that if it's actually coming from a place of kindness and compassion that you're going to be deceptive, but it's actually because your heart is entirely out of compassion. I don't think that that's creating this delusional sense of self that is creating two realities and all of that. I think it's actually being kind and compassionate in that way. And I would, I would once again, I would say, only the bodhisattva knows if it's coming from a place of kindness and compassion. So, Izzy, I hope that answers your question. Oh, by the way, though, Izzy, I did want to say this. Um, this is actually more uh, uh, directed at Izzy's question. I think it's also about um, being, how can I put this? being skillful with our language in that we can, that basically um, like withholding isn't the same as being deceptive and lying. And so there are skillful ways to address what you said. Like if somebody asks somebody and it's none of their business, there's more skillful ways to get around answering that that are neither deceptive nor you know problematic in that way if that makes sense and and really you know the this series and and what we're doing here tonight especially you know is really i think to explore more deeply these precepts and understand that they're coming from a place of wisdom these are not just again thou shalt nots these are you know, fully in line with the teachings uh, at large. So let's do number five. So the fifth precept is another tricky one in that way. 
And it's tricky for a few different reasons. So this is the prohibition against intoxication. So uh, sur, Sura Maria Maja Padama Atana, or something like that. It's a long one. And there are four words, five aspects to this word. The first Sura, and then Meraya, and then Maja. Those three all are about liquor, about fermented alcoholic drinks. And then Pamada is about carelessness or heedlessness. And then the last, Atana, is about these intoxicating, inebriating substances that put one that put one in a place of carelessness. That is actually sort of what the the whole fifth prohibition is about. So it's not even just about the inebriation, but they even within the precept itself say, and the reason why you should avoid inebriation is because it leads to carelessness. So let's get into it. So, oh, and I didn't, I didn't mention this. I meant to mention this at the beginning, but I, and I've mentioned it in the past, but I did my uh, master's thesis. So my master's thesis in Buddhist studies, I studied the monastic code. So all of, all of the precepts, not just these five, but all of them as they were practiced in medieval China. Like that's what my thesis was about. And in particular, what I was looking at was what aspects of the moral code, what aspects of it did the Chinese preserve? And what aspects did they decide were, you know, that, oh, that's some, that's some Indian stuff, right? We don't need to do that over here. And in doing that thesis, I became very familiar with all of the monastic code, all of the precepts. And I did a lot of research into all of them. And when you dig into the fifth precept, it's first of all, it's very clear that it's about fermented, inebriating drinks, like what we would call alcohol, liquor in that way. And I say this because the, the prohibition here is against stupefaction. It's against things that dull the mind. And what, um, what a lot of the commentary will tell you is that the fifth precept is about meditation. And the idea is, is that, the, that alcohol clouds the mind and meditation is about, we're, we're going for clarity. We're going for a clear mind. And so we can't have a clear mind if right before our meditation, we are clouding our mind in that way. Now, I mention this because, you know, the Buddhists, and I just recently read a, a, a really good scholarly book about this. Um, I read a really good scholarly book about tea, about the history of tea. And at least according to Victor Mayer, who is a great uh, sinologist, meaning, a, 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 you know, studies China, it does seem that the Buddhists invented tea. Like, were the first to cultivate the bush, the tea plant. They were the first to cure it. They were the first to sell it. All of that. And the reason why they were really into the tea is because it was a stimulant. And because it helped in meditation. And it was considered 
clarifying. So I say that not so that it, everybody's like, oh, you mean so we can do stimulants? <laughs> don't, get, don't get carried away. I just want you to understand what the prohibition against alcohol is about. It's about things that make you sleepy, stupefied, cloudy in that way, and that ultimately affect our judgment and make us heedless or careless in that way. So that's what this prohibition is about. The opposite of this, again, is mindfulness, clarity of mind in that way. And, you know, this is kind of one of those ones where I'll tell you this, in a lot of, uh, basically in most of Asia, like when I've traveled through Japan, Taiwan, China, and all of that, if you ever mention that you don't drink, the presumption is you're a Buddhist. Like Buddhism and not drinking are synonymous in Asian cultures. It's that much a part of the, the tradition in that way. So Buddhism has this reputation for just not being into alcohol in that sense. From, oh, it's already, oh, it's already time. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to tell you two things really quickly. The first thing I'll tell you is a little uh, upaya, an example of upaya that pertains to alcohol. It's a Chinese story, and it's about an empress who knew that her husband, the emperor, was about to lead a, um, a basically, a, um, he, the emperor was about to go kill a bunch of people. And so the empress, as an upaya, got him drunk. And what the story is, is that it was okay for the, for the empress and the emperor to get drunk because it spared the lives of all those people. It's a great example of what I'm kind of talking about as far as if you're coming from a place of kindness and compassion, it kind of supersedes certain things in that way. So I mentioned that and then... It's kind of all I can mention. I guess the, the other, the only other thing I was going to mention was that it also becomes, and this is kind of a funny ender to this evening. There's kind of a, um, it's a thing that happens. And what it is, it's the, it, it, this happens in China, but also very much in Japan. And it's the drunken Zen master. There are many, many stories about the drunken Zen master and the Zen master who actually breaks the precepts and gets drunk. And the idea is, is that that too is an upaya. And in the Zen Buddhist tradition, what they talk about is attachment to the precepts is as much an attachment as anything else. And so in order to demonstrate that, the Zen master gets inebriated. But again, it's considered an upaya to demonstrate non-attachment to the precepts. In other words, that Zen teacher is doing it for the students, not for their own good time in that way. All right, everybody, that's going to do it. I did have other big plans, but at least we did all five precepts in, in, in a good way. So there's any leftover questions, comments, answers, ideas. Then that's going to be it for tonight. Yay. Uh, before everyone runs away, thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. I. I also lost track of time. And uh, do you have any announcements? 
Uh, really quickly, yeah. Next weekend, I'm starting two new courses of my own. One on Saturdays. It's a six-week course on dependent origination on Pratitya Samutpatta. And then on Sunday mornings, I'm starting an eight-week course on Tathata, that idea of suchness or the ground of being is what they call it in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, and that's, yeah, again, Sunday mornings at nine o'clock or Saturday mornings at nine o'clock. Uh, and those are two classes. And you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com and register or read more about the classes. So that's it. Thanks, Noam.